Hello, I'm John Owens, Editor-in-Chief of Boating Magazine. You know, on the highway, we follow the rules of the road, or at least most of them, instinctively. Well, on the water, we have rules of the road, too. Unfortunately, they're not quite the same as the rules we have on the highway. And that's what this program is about, to show you the rules of the road and how they can make your boating more enjoyable and safer for everyone. Rules of the Road is a commonly used name or title for a set of navigation rules established to prevent collisions during navigation. There are two separate sets of rules that are very similar to each other. One for international waters, as defined by demarcation lines, and the other for inland waters, which contains some local variation. The international rules, called the International Regulations for Preventing Collisions at Sea, 1972, became effective in the United States in July 15, 1977. The Inland Rules Act of 1980 became effective on December 24, 1981, except for the Great Lakes, which were effective March 1, 1983. The International Maritime Organization, or IMC, adopted nine amendments that became effective on November 19, 1989. This program does not cover every rule in detail. It does reflect applicable changes made up to the date of this release, which is October 1, 2003. And it does cover most of the rules that should be of prime interest to voters. This video does not intend to replace the written rules and supplemental information and explanation of the written rules. It's recommended that every boater obtain a copy of the rules and become thoroughly familiar with them for two reasons. Boat safety and the fact that you are required by law to follow them. You can obtain copies of the rules from the U.S. Government Printing Office, the GPO, at GPO bookstores and GPO sales agents. You may order a copy from the Superintendent of Documents, U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., 20402. Before we begin, please be advised that you are responsible for your safety. Nothing replaces prudence and good judgment. The program owners and producers assume no responsibility for any consequential losses of any nature as a result of this video. Steering and sailing rules are separately distinguished by the rules. Although the programs directed at powerboat operators, sailing rules are covered in many instances because the powerboater has to know and recognize them in order to avoid collisions with sailing vessels. Also, please be advised that all kinds and sizes of vessels are included in the rules. Everything applies to any size and type unless stated otherwise. We'll begin by covering the subdivisions of the inland rules and only those international rules that are different from the inland rules. Again, both are very similar. In fact, the adopted inland rules required that the inland rules conform as close as possible to the international rules. Part A of the General Rules, Rule 1, states that these rules apply to all vessels upon the inland waters of the United States and to all vessels of the United States on the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes to the extent that there's no conflict with Canadian law. The rest of Rule 1 has to do with other legal, construction and equipment requirements and special rules made by the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of the Department under which the Coast Guard is operating. Rule 2 has to do with responsibility. It states that nothing in these rules shall exonerate any vessel or the owner, master, or crew thereof from any consequences of any neglect to comply with these rules or the neglect of any precaution which may be required by the ordinary practice of seamen or by special circumstances of the case. 
In construing and complying with these rules, due regard shall be had to all dangers of navigation and collision, and to any special circumstances, including the limitations of the vessels involved, which may make a departure from these rules necessary in order to avoid immediate danger. Rule 3 has to do with general definitions, and are well worth reviewing in detail. The word vessel includes every description of watercraft, including non-displacement craft or seaplanes, used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on the water. The term power-driven vessel means any vessel propelled by machinery. The term sailing vessel means any vessel under sail, provided that propelling machinery, if fitted, is not being used. The term vessel engaged in fishing means any vessel fishing with nets, lines, trawls, or other fishing apparatus which restricts maneuverability. It does not include a fishing vessel with trolling lines or other fishing apparatus that doesn't restrict maneuverability. The word seaplane includes any aircraft designed to maneuver on the water. The term vessel not under command means a vessel which through some exceptional circumstances is unable to maneuver in her ability as required by these rules and is therefore unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. The term a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver means a vessel which from the nature of her work is restricted in her ability to maneuver as required by these rules and is therefore unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. It then continues to give examples of such vessels. The word underway means that a vessel is not at anchor or made fast to the shore or aground. The words length and breadth of a vessel means that her length overall and greatest breadth. Vessels shall be deemed in sight of one another only when one can be observed visually from the other. The term restricted visibility means any condition in which visibility is restricted by fog, mist, falling snow, heavy rainstorms, sandstorms, or any other similar causes. The next paragraph defines western rivers, and the one after that defines the Great Lakes. Secretary means the secretary of the department in which the Coast Guard is operating. Inland waters means the navigable waters of the United States shoreward of the national demarcation lines, dividing the high seas from harbors, rivers, and other inland waters of the United States, and the waters of the Great Lakes on the United States side of the international boundary. This, for the most part, covers the general rules number one through three for the inland waters. The general rules for international waters are almost identical except that rule number one states that these rules shall apply to all vessels upon the high seas and in all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels. Part B of the inland rules are the steering and sailing rules. They have to do with the conduct of vessels. Rule four states that the rules in this subpart apply in any condition of visibility. Rule 5 requires a lookout. It states that every vessel shall at all times maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing as well as by all means appropriate in the prevailing circumstances and conditions so as to make a full appraisal of the situation and of the risk of collision. Consider Rule 6 carefully. Many are unaware that Rule 6 requires all vessels to operate at a safe speed stating that every vessel shall at all times proceed at a safe speed so that she can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within a distance appropriate to the prevailing conditions and circumstances. In determining a safe speed, the following factors shall be among those taken into account. All vessels must consider the state of visibility, the traffic density, including the concentration of fishing vessels or any other vessels, the maneuverability of the vessels with special reference to stopping distance and turning ability in the prevailing conditions, at night, the presence of background lights such as from shore lights or from backscatter of her own lights, 
the state of wind, sea, and current, and the proximity of navigational hazards, the draft in relation to the available depth of water. Additionally, vessels with operational radar must consider several other issues we won't go into. Rule 7 covers the risk of collision. It should be reviewed in detail for certain. Every vessel shall use all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions to determine if risk of collision exists. If there's any doubt, such risk shall be deemed to exist. Proper use shall be made of radar equipment if fitted and operational, including long-range scanning to obtain early warning risk of collision and radar plotting or equivalent systematic observation of detected objects. Assumptions shall not be made on the basis of scanty information, especially scanty radar information. In determining if risk of collision exists, the following considerations shall be among those taken into account. Such risk shall be deemed to exist if the compass bearing of an approaching vessel does not appreciably change and such risk may sometimes exist even when an appreciable bearing change is evident. Rule 8 covers action to avoid collisions. It states that any action taken to avoid a collision shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, be positive, made in ample time, and with due regard to the observance of good seamanship. Any alterations of course or speed to avoid collision shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, be large enough to be readily apparent to another vessel observing visually or by radar. Successions of small alterations of course or speed should be avoided. If there's sufficient sea room, alteration of course alone may be the most effective action to avoid a close quarters situation, provided that it's made in good time, is substantial, and doesn't result in another close quarters situation. Action taken to avoid collision with another vessel shall be such as to result in passing at a safe distance. The effectiveness of the action shall be carefully checked until the other vessels finally passed and clear. If necessary to avoid collision or to allow more time to assess the situation, a vessel shall slacken her speed or take all the way off by stopping or reversing her means of propulsion. It states that a vessel proceeding along a course of a narrow channel or fairway shall keep as near to the outer limit of the channel or fairway which lies on her starboard side as it is safe and practicable. If applicable, you should review the part pertaining to the Great Lakes, Western Rivers, or waters specified by the Secretary. Continuing, a vessel of less than 20 meters in length or a sailing vessel shall not impede the passage of a vessel that can safely navigate only within a narrow channel or fairway. A vessel engaged in fishing shall not impede the passage of any other vessel that can safely navigate only within a narrow channel or fairway. A vessel shall not cross a narrow channel or fairway if such crossing impedes the passage of a vessel which can safely navigate only within that channel or fairway. The latter vessel shall use the danger signal prescribed in Rule 34D if in doubt as to the intention of the crossing vessel. In a narrow channel or fairway, when overtaking, the vessel intending to overtake shall indicate her intention by sounding the appropriate signal described in Rule 34C and take steps to permit safe passing. The power-driven vessel being overtaken, if in agreement, shall sound the same signal and may, if specifically agreed, to take steps to permit safe passing. If in doubt, she shall sound the danger signal prescribed in Rule 34D. We'll cover Rule 34 later. This rule does not relieve the overtaking vessel of her obligation under Rule 13. 
A vessel nearing a bend or an area of a narrow channel or fairway where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall navigate with particular alertness and caution. Rule 10 covers vessel traffic services and simply states that the rule applies to traffic separation schemes and does not relieve any vessel of her obligation under any other rule. The Inland Steering and Sailing Rules Subpart 2 has to do with the conduct of vessels in sight of one another. Rule 11 simply states that the rules in this subpart apply to vessels in sight of one another. Rule 12 involves sailing vessels only. Rule 13 covers overtaking another vessel. It states that, notwithstanding anything contained in Rules 4 through 18, any vessel overtaking any other shall keep out of the way of the vessel being overtaken. A vessel shall be deemed to be overtaking when coming up with another vessel from a direction more than 22 and a half degrees abaft of her beam. That is, in such a position in reference to the vessel she's overtaking, that at night she'd only be able to see the stern light of that vessel, but neither of her side lights. When a vessel's in any doubt as to whether she's overtaking another, she shall assume that this is the case and act accordingly. Any subsequent alteration of the bearing between the two vessels shall not make the overtaking vessel a crossing vessel within the meaning of these rules or relieve her of the duty of keeping clear of the overtaken vessel until she's finally passed and clear. Rule 14 covers head-on situations. Unless otherwise agreed when two power-driven vessels are meeting on a reciprocal or nearly reciprocal courses so as to involve the risk of collision, each shall alter her course to starboard so that each shall pass on the port side of the other. Such a situation shall be deemed to exist when a vessel sees the other ahead or nearly ahead and by night she could see the mast headlights of the other in a line or nearly in a line or both side lights and by day she observes the corresponding aspect of the other vessel. When a vessel's in any doubt as to whether such a situation exists she shall assume that it does exist and act accordingly. Paragraph D has to do with the Great Lakes, Western Rivers or waters specified by the Secretary. Rule 15 covers crossing situations. When two power-driven vessels are crossing so as to involve a risk of collision, the vessel which has the other on her starboard side shall keep out of the way and shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, avoid crossing ahead of the other vessel. Paragraph B again clarifies the Great Lakes, Western Rivers, and waters specified by the Secretary. Rule 16 states that every vessel which is directed to keep out of the way of another shall, so far as possible, take early and substantial action to keep well clear. Rule 17 states that where one of two vessels is to keep out of the way, the other shall keep her course and speed. The latter vessel may, however, take action to avoid collision by her maneuver alone as soon as it becomes apparent that collision cannot be avoided by action of the giveaway vessel alone, she shall take such actions as will best aid to avoid collision. A power-driven vessel which takes action in a crossing situation in accordance with subparagraph A-2 of this rule to avoid collision with another power-driven vessel shall, if the circumstances of the case admit, not alter her course to port for a vessel on her own port side. This rule does not relieve the giveaway vessel of her obligation to keep out of the way.
Rule 18 puts the responsibilities between vessels in order. Except where Rules 9, 10, and 13 otherwise require, a power-driven vessel underway shall keep out of the way of a vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, a vessel engaged in fishing, and a sailing vessel. A sailing vessel underway shall keep out of the way of a vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, and a vessel engaged in fishing. A vessel engaged in fishing shall, so far as possible, keep out of the way of a vessel not under command and a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver. Every vessel shall proceed at a safe speed adapted to the prevailing circumstances and conditions of restricted visibility. A power-driven vessel shall have her engines ready for immediate maneuver. Every vessel shall have due regard to the prevailing circumstances and conditions of reduced visibility when complying with rules 4 through 10. A vessel which detects by radar alone the presence of another vessel shall determine if a close quarters situation is developing or risk of collision exists. If so, she shall take avoiding action in ample time, provided that when such action consists of an alterations of course, so far as possible the following shall be avoided. An alteration of course to port for a vessel forward of the beam other than the vessel being overtaken, and an alteration of course toward a vessel abeam or abaft of the beam. Except where it has been determined that a risk of collision does not exist, every vessel which hears apparently forward of her beam the fog signal of another vessel, or such cannot avoid a close quarters situation with another vessel forward of her beam, shall reduce her speed to the minimum at which she can be kept on course. This completes the inland steering and sailing rules. Now let's cover the international steering and sailing rules that are different. Rule 8, Action to Avoid Collisions, adds some additional clarification regarding certain vessels in paragraph H. Rule 10, Relates to Traffic Separation Schemes. Rule 18, Responsibilities Between Vessels, Add some rules to do with vessels constrained by their draft. Except for Western Rivers and Great Lakes differences in the inland rules, these are the only major differences in the steering and sailing rules for inland and international waters. Now let's get into Part C of the rules. Naturally, you can't determine who has right of way unless you can see other boats, and they can see you. That's why the navigational rules also cover navigation lights. During the day in conditions of good visibility, you can see other boats and observe their size, course, and get an idea of their speed. In most cases, you can assess the chances of a collision fairly easily. At night, it is usually much more difficult. The only clue of another vessel's presence is its lights. Lights of various colors are required at certain locations on vessels to help others observe their presence, but also observe their speed, course, limitations, and proximity to other boats. They must be visible up to a certain distance in order to comply with the rules. At this point, we'd like to mention that you, not the manufacturer, dealer, or anyone else is responsible for your boat's lights. The type, color, Visibility, placement, etc. of your boat's lights is considered your responsibility, even if installed improperly by the manufacturer or anyone else. Navigation lights aid boaters in preventing collisions and indicating the boat's position and aiding boaters in determining who has the right of way. Day shapes represent vessels engaged in certain types of operations. They help prevent collisions by letting other boaters know the boat's intentions limitations and purpose.
The rules concerning lights shall be complied with from sunset to sunrise, and during such time no other lights shall be exhibited except such lights as cannot be mistaken for the lights specified in the rules or interfere with the keeping of a proper lookout. The lights prescribed in these rules shall, if carried, also be exhibited from sunrise to sunset in restricted visibility and may be exhibited in all other circumstances when it's deemed necessary. The rules concerning shapes shall be complied with by day. The lights and shapes specified in these rules shall comply with the provisions of Annex 1 of these rules. Annex 1 has to do with the technical specifications of lights and shapes required. Rule 21 defines certain lights and shapes. There are seven types. A masthead light means a white light placed over the fore and aft center line of the vessel, showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 225 degrees, and so fixed as to show the light from right across to 22 and a half degrees abaft the beam on either side of the vessel, except that on a vessel of less than 12 meters in length, the masthead light shall be placed as nearly as practicable to the fore and aft center line of the vessel. Side lights mean a green light on the starboard side and a red light on the port side, each showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 112 and a half degrees, or so fixed as to show the light from the right ahead to 22 and a half degrees abaft the beam on its respective side. On a vessel of less than 20 meters in length, the side lights may be combined into one lantern and shall be placed as nearly as practicable to the fore and center line of the vessel. A stern light means a white light placed as nearly as practicable at the stern, showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of 135 degrees and so fixed as to show the light 67 and a half degrees from right aft on each side of the vessel. Towing light means a yellow light having the same characteristics as a stern light defined in paragraph C of this rule. An all-round light means a light showing an unbroken light over the arc of the horizon of 360 degrees. Flashing light means a light flashing at regular intervals of a frequency of 120 flashes or more per minute. Special flashing light means a yellow light flashing at regular intervals at a frequency of 50 to 70 flashes per minute. Placed as far forward and as nearly practicable on the fore and aft center line of the toe and showing an unbroken light over an arc of the horizon of not less than 180 degrees nor more than 225 degrees. And so fixed as to show the light from right ahead to a beam and no more than 22 and a half degrees abaft the beam on either side of the vessel. The international rules do not include special flashing lights. Rule 22 covers the visibility of lights and states that the lights prescribed in these rules shall have an intensity as specified in Annex 1 to these rules, so as to be visible at the following minimum ranges. In a vessel of 50 meters or more in length, the following ranges apply. In a vessel of 12 meters or more but less than 50 meters in length, these ranges apply. In a vessel of less than 12 meters in length, these ranges apply. In a conspicuous, partly submerged vessel or object being towed, a white all-round light should be able to be seen for three miles or more. Rule 23 covers power-driven vessels underway. A power-driven vessel shall exhibit a masthead light forward, a second masthead light abaft of and higher than the forward one, 
except that a vessel of less than 50 meters in length shall not be obliged to exhibit such light, but may do so. Side lights and a stern light is also required. An air cushion vessel when operating in non-displacement mode shall, in addition to the lights just mentioned, exhibit an all-round flashing yellow light where it can best be seen. A power-driven vessel of less than 12 meters in length may, in lieu of the lights prescribed, exhibit an all-round white light and side lights. In international waters, a power-driven vessel of less than 7 meters in length, whose maximum speed doesn't exceed 7 knots, is required to exhibit side lights only if it's practicable. Another exemption for international rules is that the masthead light or all-round white light on a power-driven vessel of less than 12 meters in length may be displaced from the fore and aft center line of the vessel if the center line fitting is not practicable. Provided that the side lights are combined on one lantern which shall be carried on the fore and aft center line of the vessel or located as near as practicable to the same fore and aft line as the masthead light or the all-round white light. A power-driven vessel when operating on the Great Lakes may carry an all-round white light in lieu of a second masthead light and stern light prescribed in paragraph A of this rule. The light shall be carried on the position of the second masthead light and shall be visible at the same minimum range. Inland Lights and Shapes Rule 25 covers sailing vessels and vessels under oars. It's important for the power boater to recognize these lights. Sailing vessels underway shall exhibit side lights and a stern light. In a sailing vessel of less than 20 meters in length, the lights prescribed may be combined in one lantern carried at the top of the mast where it can best be seen. A sailing vessel underway may, in addition to the lights prescribed in paragraph A of the rule, exhibit at or near the top of the mast where they can best be seen two all-round lights in a vertical line, the upper being red and the lower green. But these lights shall not be exhibited in conjunction with the combined lantern permitted in paragraph B of this rule. A sailing vessel of less than 7 meters in length shall, if practicable, exhibit the lights described in paragraph A or B of the rule. But if she does not, she shall have ready at hand an electric torch or lighted lantern showing a white light which can be exhibited in sufficient time to prevent collision. A vessel under oars may exhibit the lights prescribed in this rule for sailing vessels but if she does not, she shall have ready at hand an electric torch or lighted lantern showing a white light which can be exhibited in sufficient time to prevent collision. A vessel proceeding under sail when also being propelled by machinery shall exhibit forward where it can best be seen a conical shape apex downward. A vessel of less than 12 meters in length is not required to exhibit this shape but may do so. This exclusion for vessels under 12 meters does not apply to the international rules. Inland Lights and Shapes Rule 26 covers fishing vessels and states that a vessel engaged in fishing, whether underway or at anchor, 
shall exhibit only the lights and shapes prescribed in this rule. They are as shown. A vessel engaged in fishing other than trawling shall exhibit lights and shapes as shown in this illustration. Inland Lights and Shapes Rule 27 covers vessels not under command or restricted in their ability to maneuver and states that a vessel not under command shall exhibit lights and shapes as seen here. A vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, except a vessel engaged in mine clearance operations, shall exhibit lights as illustrated on this diagram. There is no Inland Rule 28. The International Lights and Shapes Rule 28 covers vessels constrained by their draft. Inland Lights and Shapes Rule 29 covers pilot vessels. A vessel engaged in pilotage duty shall exhibit lights as shown in this illustration. Inland Lights and Shapes Rule 30 covers anchored vessels and vessels aground. A vessel at anchor shall exhibit where it can be seen in the four part and all round white light or one ball, and at or near the stern and at a lower level than the light previously prescribed, an all round white light. A vessel of less than 50 meters in length may exhibit an all round white light where it can best be seen instead of the lights mentioned previously. A vessel at anchor may, or a vessel of 100 meters or more in length shall, also use the available working or equivalent lights to illuminate her decks. A vessel aground shall exhibit the lights prescribed in paragraph A or B of the rule and, in addition, if practicable, where it can best be seen, two all-round red lights in a vertical line and three balls in a vertical line. The following paragraphs of the rules cover small vessels that may interest you. A vessel of less than 7 meters in length when at anchor, not near a narrow channel or a fairway, or where other vessels normally navigate, are not required to exhibit the lights or shapes prescribed in paragraphs A and B of this rule. A vessel of less than 12 meters in length when aground shall not be required to exhibit the lights or shapes described in subparagraph D of this rule. A vessel of less than 20 meters in length, when at anchor in a special anchorage area designated by the secretary, shall not be required to exhibit anchor lights and shapes as required by this rule. This concludes both the inland and international lights and shapes rules. Now let's cover Inland Rules Part D, Sound and Light Signals. Navigational rules also cover certain sound signals. Horns and bells help you carry out the rules of the road, especially if you're caught in fog, heavy rain, or snow. Rule 32 defines certain terms used in the rules. The word whistle means a sound signaling appliance capable of producing the prescribed blast and which complies with the specifications in Annex 3 to the rules. The term short blast means a blast of about one second's duration. The term prolonged blast means a blast from four to six seconds duration. Rule 33 covers equipment for sound signals. A vessel of 12 meters or more in length shall be provided with a whistle and a bell. And a vessel of 100 meters or more shall, in addition, be provided with a gong, the tone and sound of which cannot be confused with that of a bell. 
A vessel of less than 12 meters in length shall not be obliged to carry the sound signaling appliances, but if she does not, she shall be provided with some other means of making an efficient sound signal. Rule 34 covers maneuvering and warning signals. When power-driven vessels are inside of one another and meeting or crossing at a distance of one half mile of one another, each vessel underway, when maneuvering as authorized or required by these rules, shall indicate that maneuver by the following signals on her whistle. One short blast to mean, I intend to leave you on my port side. Two short blasts to mean, I intend to leave you on my starboard side. and three short blasts to mean I'm operating a stern propulsion. Upon hearing one or two blast signals, the other shall, if in agreement, sound the same whistle signal and take steps necessary to effect a safe passing. If, however, from a cause the vessel doubts the safety of the proposed maneuver, she shall sound the danger signal and take appropriate precautionary action until a safe passing agreement is made. A vessel may supplement the whistle signals prescribed by light signals. These signals shall have the following significance. One flash to mean, I intend to leave you on my port side. Two flashes to mean, I intend to leave you on my starboard side. And three flashes to mean, I'm operating a stern propulsion. The duration of each flash should be about one second, and the light used for this signal shall, if fitted, be an all-round white or yellow light visible at a minimum range of two miles, synchronized with the whistle, and shall comply with the provisions of Annex 1 of these rules. When in sight of one another, a power-driven vessel intending to overtake another power-driven vessel shall indicate her intention by the following signals on her whistle. One short blast to mean, I intend to overtake you on your starboard side. Two short blasts to mean, I intend to overtake you on your port side. And the power-driven vessel about to be overtaken shall, if in agreement, sound a similar sound signal. If in doubt, she should sound the danger signal prescribed in paragraph D. When vessels inside of one another are approaching each other and from any cause, either vessel fails to understand the intentions or actions of the other, or is in doubt whether sufficient action is being taken by the other to avoid collision, the vessel in doubt shall immediately indicate such doubt by giving at least five short and rapid blasts on the whistle. This signal may be supplemented by a light signal of at least five short and rapid flashes. A vessel nearing a bend or an area of a channel or fairway where other vessels might be obscured by an intervening obstruction shall sound one prolonged blast. The signal should be answered with a prolonged blast by any approaching vessel that may be within hearing around the bend or behind the intervening obstruction. If whistles are fitted on a vessel at a distance apart of more than 100 meters, one whistle only shall be used for giving maneuvering and warning signals. When a power-driven vessel is leaving a dock or berth, she shall sound one prolonged blast. A vessel that reaches agreement with another vessel in a head-on crossing or overtaking situation as, for example, by using the radio telephone as prescribed by the Vessel Bridge-to-Bridge -Bridge Radio Telephone Act is not obliged to sound the whistle signals prescribed by this rule, but may do so. If agreement's not reached, then whistle signals shall be exchanged in a timely manner and shall prevail.
Rule 35 covers sound signals in restricted visibility. In or near an area of restricted visibility, whether by day or night, the signals prescribed in this rule shall be used as follows. A power-driven vessel making way through the water shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes one prolonged blast. A power-driven vessel underway but stopped and making no way through the water shall sound at intervals of not more than two minutes, two prolonged blasts in succession with an interval of about two seconds between them. A vessel not under command, a vessel restricted in her ability to maneuver, whether underway or at anchor, a sailing vessel, a vessel engaged in fishing, whether underway or at anchor, a vessel engaged or towing or pushing another vessel shall, instead of the signals prescribed, sound at intervals of not more than two minutes, three blasts in succession, namely one prolonged followed by two short blasts. Rule 36 covers signals to attract attention. If necessary to attract the attention of another vessel, a vessel may make light or sound signals that cannot be mistaken for any signal authorized elsewhere in the rules, or may direct the beam of her searchlight in the direction of danger in such a way as to not embarrass any vessel. We'll leave it up to you, if we may, to interpret that one. Rule 37, Distress Signals, states that when a vessel's in distress and requires assistance, she shall use or exhibit the signals described in Annex 4 of these rules. They are Red Star Shells Foghorn Continuous Sounding flames on vessel, a gun fired at intervals of one minute, an orange background with a black ball and square, SOS, mayday by radio, parachute red flare, die marker of any color, Code flags November Charlie, square flag and ball, wave arms, radio telegraph alarm, radio telephone alarm, position indicating radio beacon, smoke, and a high-intensity white light flashing at 50 to 70 times a minute. Part E covers exemption to the rules under Rule 38. There are several annexes to the rules. Inland and International Rules Annex No. 1 includes positioning and technical details of lights and shapes. Inland and International Rules Annex 2 covers additional signals for fishing vessels fishing in close proximity. Annex 3 covers technical details of sound signal appliances for both the inland and international rules. Annex 4 covers distress signals previously described under Rule 37. Annex 5 covers pilot rules for inland waters. This concludes the basic navigational rules or rules of the road. Again, we suggest you obtain a copy of the written rules Study them carefully, along with reviewing this program occasionally. On behalf of Bennett Marine Video, we wish you many happy and safe voyages. Well, you see, the Coast Guard's rules of the road aren't really that complicated. And they can keep you safe. And plus, they're the law. You may want to review this tape every now and then to make sure you're familiar with the basic regulations. Remember, out on the water, nothing is as important as safety. I'm John Owens. On behalf of Boating Magazine, thanks a lot. I'll see you out there.
The term aids to navigation covers a lot of territory. These can range from a single piling to the latest in satellite technology. But for our purpose, we're going to remain with a group commonly referred to as visual aids. These include buoys and day beacons, lights, fog signals, ranges, and light towers. Now, there are other structures and geographical features, and they can be utilized for navigational aids. And these generally fall into a category known as landmarks. And landmarks are such as smokestacks and antennas, water towers, mountain peaks, and so forth. They're usually prominently marked on navigational charts, and they're extremely helpful in establishing bearings from a given point. Buoys are floating objects that are anchored to the bottom by a length of chain known as the scope. This scope of chain allows for current, tides, and the effects of wind upon the buoy. While the buoy may be technically on station due to the scope of the anchor chain, it may be in water just a shade shallower than you would care for it to be in. Therefore, it's always a good sound practice to pass on the deep water side of the buoy with a good distance between your vessel and the buoy. In areas of tidal extremes, this is extremely important. There are several shapes, sizes, and colors of buoys as determined by purpose and location. In addition to lights, some buoys may be equipped with bells, whistles, gongs, or other audible warning devices. Day beacons are unlighted fixed structures that may consist of one or more pilings. When these structures contain several pilings, they're referred to as dolphins. Day beacons may contain one or more signboards known as day marks. The colors and shapes of day marks are determined by the information provided. In all navigable waters under the federal jurisdiction, or in areas specified by the armed forces, the United States Coast Guard is the agency that is responsible for the installation and the maintenance of all navigational aids. On bodies of water within the boundaries of a single state now, that particular state is responsible for the installation and the maintenance of all aids to navigation. Private aids to navigation can be established in federal waters by agencies or individuals other than the Coast Guard, but it requires prior approval. Regardless of who establishes an aid to navigation, that aid is protected by federal law. It is a criminal offense to damage or cause a failure in the operation of any aid. Furthermore, it is illegal to tie up to any buoy, marker, day beacon, or light structure. Tying up to that favorite fishing spot might just cause you some real grief, so don't do it. If you notice damage to an aid, or any aid that's not working properly, or is out of position in accordance with a published chart, contact the Coast Guard as soon as possible. Channel 16 on your VHF radio should get you in touch with the proper people. Any suggestions on improvements to existing aids or the need for additional aids should be sent directly to the Coast Guard headquarters in Washington, D.C. As we stated before, the United States uses a lateral system of buoys throughout the waters under federal jurisdiction, and wherever else the system can be applied. This system basically places markers such as buoys and day beacons, lights, and etc., to allow the boater to know the position of a vessel in relation to the existing channel, whether natural or dredged. This system is predicated on the position of a vessel returning from seaward. When certain channels do not extend from seaward, certain standard assumptions and rulings are established to indicate the proper placement of channel markers. For coloring and numbering purposes, for channels not leading from seaward, the following system has been established. The easiest way to remember the system is to think of traveling around the United States in a clockwise direction. 
When heading south from the coast of Maine to Florida, the red markers should remain on the right side of the channel, with the green on the left. This holds true when moving northerly and then westerly along the Gulf Coast, and again as you head north along the west coast. Along with red, right, and returning, another rule would be that red buoys are the ones closest to the major landmass. On the Great Lakes, the buoys are placed, colored, and numbered as if traveling from the outlet end of each lake to the upper end. This will generally be in a westerly direction, except for Lake Michigan, where it becomes mostly southward. Buoys leading from the major body of the lake into the harbors of major metropolitan areas are numbered just as channels leading from seaward into coastal ports. On the Ohio and Mississippi rivers and their tributaries, the channels are marked as though you are proceeding from seaward toward the head of the river. Be careful though, local terminology can get confusing because the terms left bank and right bank refer to positions relative to the flow of the river to seaward. Buoys are painted specific colors to indicate the proper position for passing or special purposes. Green buoys, black under the old system, are placed to indicate the left side of the channel or hazard when approaching from seaward and should be passed to port. Red buoys mark the right side of the channel or hazard and should be passed to starboard. Red and green horizontally banded buoys, red and black under the old system, indicate a junction or hazard in the waterway that can be passed on either side. The uppermost band of color will indicate the preferred channel. The uppermost band of color will indicate the preferred channel. Red top is the right channel preferred, and a green top is the left channel. One important warning must be emphasized at this point. When traveling outbound toward the sea, it may not be safe to pass this buoy safely on either side due to the type of hazard being marked. Be sure to consult the chart for this area if any doubt exists. Red and white vertical strap buoys, or black and white under the old system, mark the middle of the channel or fairway. They're also used to divide the in and out channels in areas of high traffic. It should also be noted that areas of color running horizontally around the buoys are referred to as bands, and those moving vertically are referred to as stripes. These terms are used throughout the system of voyage used in the United States. Buoys are also indicative of their position relative to the existing channel. This shape recognition can become very important when visibility is impaired due to sun reflection, reduced visibility, etc., when only a silhouette can be seen. Can buoys are painted green, black under the old system, mark the left or port side of the channel or hazard when returning from seaward, and should be passed to port. None buoys are painted red and mark the right side of the channel or hazard and should be passed to starboard when returning from seaward. Channel junction and obstruction buoys may be either can or none buoys. The uppermost color band indicates the side of the preferred channel and the shape of the buoy. If the top band is green or black, the buoy is a can. If the top strip is red, it's a nun. If the buoy has red and white vertical stripes, it can either be can or nun, and its shape has no special significance. In the same manner, shape has no significance for a bell, gong, whistle, lighted, or combination buoy. In these cases, the purpose of the buoys is established by their numbering, color, or light characteristics. The numbering system currently utilizes a series of numbers and letters, or a combination thereof, to allow boaters to find and identify the buoys on their local charts. This numbering system also allows the boater to determine the proper passing position for any aid to navigation. 
Odd-numbered buoys mark the left side of the channel when returning from seaward, and they will be green or black, and will be cans if they're unlighted. The numbers on the buoys will increase from seaward inshore, and will usually maintain a certain sequence on both sides of the channel. In some cases, however, where buoys are not placed in pairs, the numerical series will vary. In some areas of long, straight channels where buoys are placed far apart, some numbers are omitted to allow for future additions. Buoy numbers, followed by letters 2A to 7B, are indicative of buoys that have been added and the entire series of buoys for that channel have not been renumbered. Those buoys marking wrecks near a channel will usually be lighted and carry the number of the buoy preceding it followed by the letters WR. For instance, a buoy marking a wreck on the right hand side of the channel between buoys 2 and 4 would have the marking WR2A. Buoys marking wrecks not associated with the channel will usually be marked with one or two letters associated with the wrecked vessel or some geographical location. These buoys are generally placed in the seaward or channel side of the wreck as close as possible to the actual hazard. However, it is possible that either the buoy or the wreck may have shifted due to the wind or tidal action so extreme caution should be exercised when traveling through these areas. Buoys with red and white or black and white, vertical stripes or with red and green, red and black horizontal bands are usually marked with letters and no numbers. A good example of this would be a sea buoy marking the entrance to a harbor channel. Offshore dangers are often marked with numbers followed by letters of local geographical importance. For instance, a buoy marked 2BS might be used to mark a location known as Bull Shoals. The two would have the same sequential significance as any other buoy. The lighting system used on buoys is very simple. Red lights are used to mark the red even-numbered buoys on the right-hand side of the channel when entering from seaward, and for red and green, red and black, horizontally banded buoys where the top band is red. Green is used for the lights on the odd-numbered buoys on the left side of the channel, and on red and green horizontally banded buoys where the top band is green. White lights were used under the old system on the buoys of all colors. The main reason for white was to increase the visibility of certain lights under difficult viewing conditions. Different light phase characteristics are utilized for different specific purposes. Flashing lights with a flash rate of not more than 30 flashes per minute are placed on green or black buoys, and in some cases, buoys used for special purposes. Quick flashing buoys, with a flash rate of not less than 60 flashes per minute, are used to mark channel edges, where special attention should be exercised. These quick flashes usually mark turns, changes in channel width, or safety hazards. Interrupted quick flashing lights are used on red and green, or red and black, horizontally banded buoys, and consist of a composite group flashing light. This means there will be two quick flashes, followed by a quick single flash repeated over and over. Morse code A flashing lights are placed on red and green or black and white vertically striped buoys that mark a fairway or mid-channel. These buoys may be passed close aboard on either side and the light is always white. The same system described in terms of lighted and unlighted buoys applies fully to the system of day beacons and minor lights. Day beacons with triangular red day marks with even numbers can be thought of as having the same characteristics and navigational requirements as none buoys. The day beacons with green square day marks and odd numbers can be thought of as nothing more than replacements for can buoys. Minor lights are used in the place of lighted or combination buoys. 
If a day beacon is used to mark a channel junction or obstruction, the day mark will be red and green horizontally banded, with the uppermost band of color indicating the preferred passage. The day mark shape will be determined by the color of the uppermost band. Day beacons marking fairways or mid channel will have an octagonal day mark painted red and white, or white and black, divided vertically down the middle. This same system of lateral buoy markings is also used in the intercoastal waterway. Now this waterway runs along the Atlantic coast, down through Florida, and up along the Gulf Coast and in through Texas. This system is marked using the premise of traveling around the mainland USA in a clockwise direction related to returning from seaward. So when traveling south from New Jersey towards Florida, the red buoys and fixed aids would remain on the right side of your vessel. Conversely, the green or black aids would be to the left. The lights on these aids follow the same set of rules used by all other aids throughout the system red lights on red aids, and green lights on green. However, these buoys and fixed aids do have a distinct marking to indicate they're part of the ICW, which is the Intercoastal Waterway. On the ICW, all buoys, lighted or unlighted, are marked with a yellow band at the top, and all day marks, lighted or unlighted, have a yellow stripe immediately below the identifying number or letters. Whenever the ICW runs in conjunction with a major coastal waterway leading from the sea, a system of dual markings has been established to allow the boater to more readily follow the ICW. This system consists of a yellow square or triangle on a conspicuous part of the aid. The yellow square indicates that aid should be kept on the left-hand side when traveling in a direction from New Jersey to Texas. The yellow triangle indicates that aid should be on the right when traveling in the same direction. In some instances, the yellow square may appear on either a green can or a red nun in a river channel or any other day beacon or fixed aid. The same holds true for the yellow triangle. This seemingly contradictory situation occurs whenever the ICW joins a river channel that may lead the ICW to or from the sea. If the ICW joins a river channel and then travels in an easterly direction, the yellow triangle would appear on the green or black aids, once again indicating a starboard side passage. When the yellow squares and triangles are added to regular aids to navigation, the yellow stripes and borders are emitted. Whenever a boater is traveling the ICW on a system of dual markings, the basic shapes and color should be disregarded and steer his or her vessel solely by the shape of the yellow markings. The numbers on the dual marked aids will be those of the river's lateral system and in some cases may actually be decreasing while traveling in a southbound direction. Normal ICW aids are numbered in groups, usually not exceeding 99, beginning with 1 or 2 at locations specified on the appropriate navigational chart. In some instances, large combination buoys having special significance such as harbor entrance buoys, have smaller unlighted buoys placed alongside. These buoys are placed away from the major marine traffic and serve as emergency buoys should the larger aid be sunk or carried away. These buoys are not shown on navigational charts, but they do appear in the appropriate light lists. There are several different types of buoys used for marking areas of specific concern. These buoys mark areas set aside for dredging, anchorages, quarantine, fishing, race courses, experimental, and testing. Under the new system established with the IALA, all special purpose buoys are yellow. Lights, if used, will also be yellow. 
However, under the old system, special areas were indicated by several different color combinations. Some of these buoys may still be in effect, especially in local areas, so boaters should be aware of their existence. White buoys mark anchorage areas. White buoys with green tops are used for dredging and survey areas. Of particular interest to boaters are the white and black horizontally banded buoys used to mark fishnet areas. These areas are where fish nets or traps may be placed on or near the surface. These areas are clearly marked on navigational charts and may be marked either by can or none buoys. In this instance, buoy shape has no significance. White and international orange buoys mark items used for special purposes. These buoys can have either horizontal vans or vertical stripes. Areas marked by these age would include, but aren't limited to, undersea oil operations, equipment, or fish havens. Each state has the authority and the responsibility of establishing and maintaining adequate aids to navigation for waters that lie solely within that state's jurisdiction. Now, with the tremendous upsurge in the number of boaters on trailers, it became pretty obvious that a uniform system of marking these navigable waters had to be established. To this end, the uniform state waterway marking system was developed by an act of Congress. The USWMS consists of a navigation of aids designed to meet the requirements of all types of vessels and is pretty much compatible with the Coast Guard's system. This system consists of two categories of aids. One is a system of regulatory aids that are used to mark hazardous or restricted areas such as speed zones or areas set aside for special uses. They're also used to provide directions and general information. The other category consists of a series of aids that supplement the federal system. The major difference between the federal system of voyage and the state system is simple. On the federal system, a boater must refer to the appropriate navigational chart to determine the information on hazards, directions, and other supplemental information concerning the data that's provided by the buoys, day markers, and lights. In the uniform state system, the markers convey that information without referring to any publication. The second category of state-maintained markers are those aids that are designed basically for navigation. Wherever possible, these aids are compatible with the federal system. Well, that's just about it. The video you've just seen, what we've tried to do, is to educate you on all the visual aspects and identification for using aids to navigation. It's not as difficult as you might think once you learn the proper use. But sometimes we as boaters tend to get in a little bit of a hurry and try to take those shortcuts. And that's when you get in trouble. So for safety's sake, Use common sense, and don't be one of those voters. As previously mentioned, buoys may be lighted or unlighted. 
They may have audible signals or have a combination of several of these identifying features. However, each type of buoy has a special purpose, and your proper position in any given channel may be ascertained once you learn to identify the buoys by their shapes. Unlighted buoys can be readily identified by their shapes. Can buoys have an appearance similar to the item they're named for? They look exactly like a large can floating in a vertical position. Some buoys have a radar reflector added to the top, but these reflectors do not significantly alter the appearance of the buoy. None buoys resemble the body of a can buoy topped with a cone-shaped pointed end. The smaller sizes of these buoys can have a somewhat rounded top with a lifting eye on the very top of the buoy. The larger buoys are equipped with lifting lugs spaced evenly around the buoy base. Unlighted buoys come in sizes ranging from above water lengths of 30 inches to 14 feet, depending upon local requirements. A totally separate type of unlighted buoys are those known as sound buoys. These buoys are identified by the characteristics of the sound they make, not by their shape. Any sound buoys within audible range of each other are provided with different sound characteristics to allow for easy identification. This means that two bell buoys will not be placed in close proximity. One bell buoy and either a gong or whistle buoy will be used instead. Bell buoys are usually round floats capped with a bell structure. The bell is suspended in the middle and is struck by clappers, usually four, to make a single note on an irregular basis. Since the bell buoy relies on wave action of some sort to activate the clappers, they're generally not used in sheltered waters. Gong buoys are similar in appearance to bell buoys, but instead of a bell inside the tower structure, they're equipped with a four-tiered gong with individual clappers for each gong. This buoy will produce four separate sounds on an irregular basis, as opposed to the single sound of a bell buoy. Whistle buoys are equipped with a fairly low frequency whistle that is powered by wave motion. As the buoy rises on the wave, air is drawn down into the buoy's whistle tube, and then as the buoy settles back lower into the water, the air is forced out of the buoy tube, through the whistle, creating the sound. This buoy relies on ground swells and is typically positioned near inlets or shoals where it's most effective. All sound buoys serve a special purpose in areas generally plagued by low visibility conditions. Almost all unlighted buoys are equipped with some sort of reflective material to assist boaters in finding them in darkness with the use of spotlights, searchlights, and sometimes even flashlights. The reflective material will generally be red, green, or yellow, and will have the same significance as the lights of the same color. Lighted buoys are equipped with lights of different colors, intensities, and flashing characteristics. The different colors and light characteristics provide essential information to the boater. The light intensity is determined by the existing conditions at each buoy's location. Items such as normal visual range, background lighting, and atmospheric conditions are utilized in determining the required brightness of any given light. Lighted buoys are equipped with battery-powered light assemblies that are capable of long-term operation without any servicing. Most are equipped with sensors that secure the lights when predetermined levels of lights exist and then return them to service as the light fades. Some of the newer assemblies are equipped with solar panels to assist in maintaining the battery charge at a normal operating level. In the past, buoys were sometimes equipped with acetylene burners and a pilot light. Mechanical timers were used to provide the proper light characteristics. Both the timers and burners provided lots of maintenance problems and the reliability of the lights suffered. With the new and more powerful batteries, 
solar panels, and light sensors, the buoys have become much more reliable. Most of the lights on the buoys are either red, green, or yellow according to their uses. Red and green go on red and green buoys, while yellow is established for buoys having special purposes, such as quarantine areas, etc. Buoys equipped with both a light and an audible system are known as combination buoys. The Coast Guard has developed a series of large offshore buoys which it uses for special purposes. Several of these monster buoys are used to replace the light ships of yesterday without incurring the cost of building and maintaining a light tower. Others are used for navigation purposes at strategic offshore locations where water depth would be a problem for a structure. Many of these buoys are also equipped with weather transmitting devices to assist in the gathering of pertinent data to assist in weather forecasting for the area. These buoys are combination buoys, lighted with a sound signal, and many are equipped with a radio beacon for long-range navigation. They're also known as excellent fish attractants. Off the east coast, several charter boats make overnight trips to these monsters for species such as tuna and dolphin. Once again, we must emphasize that it's illegal to tie up to any aid, but there's no law that says you can't fish near them. Lighted buoys have different light display patterns. There are several reasons for lights to be programmed to flash at specific intervals. Probably the most important is to allow the batteries to conserve their power. Other reasons for this flashing pattern include items such as allowing the light to be seen when it has a background of other lights. To provide the ability to distinguish this particular light from other lights within viewing range, and to relay specific information on hazards to mariners. Flashing lights are those that are on for a brief period at regular intervals. The time on is always less than the time off. These lights normally flash at a rate of approximately 30 times a minute. Quick flashing lights will flash at least 60 times per minute. These lights are utilized in special applications where quick recognition of a particular light is required. Interrupted quick flashing lights have a series of six quick flashes followed by a five second period of darkness. This series is repeated every 10 seconds. Morse code A flashing lights transmit the international symbol for the letter A. This pattern consists of a short flash, followed by a brief dark period, then a longer flash and a longer dark period. This series is repeated every 8 seconds and the color of the light is always white. Remember the period of a light is the time it takes to complete one full cycle of flashing and dark period. A light identified on a chart as a flashing 4 seconds has a period of 4 seconds. The combined light and dark intervals last exactly 4 seconds and is then repeated. Several standard time periods are used by the Coast Guard. They are 2, 4, 5, and 6 seconds. As previously stated, never bet the farm that a buoy is always where it's supposed to be. Although heavily anchored to the bottom, under certain circumstances buoys are capable of shifting position. Sometimes they have a little help from passing ships, extremely heavy tides, and strong winds. Sometimes the currents shift the position of the hazard. This is especially true around inlets with shoaling sand. Buoy batteries are known to fail, as well as the timers for their light. From time to time, they may show no signal or an erratic one. Sound actuated systems on buoys rely on wave action and motion to produce their distinctive sounds and may be rendered inoperative during low wind conditions that are often associated with periods of low visibility. All mechanical systems are subject to failure, especially those subjected to the ravages of the sea and its related hostile environment. 
all buoys are subjected to the problems mentioned. Therefore, buoys should be treated as warnings and guides. The information provided by the buoy's position should be used in conjunction with other information, such as tidal rips, visual shoaling, depth finder readings, bearings off of landmarks, and soundings. If you'll ever talk to some of the old mariners or read in your history books about it, you'll find that light towers are structures that were designed and implemented to replace the light ships that were well known along the eastern seaboard of the United States. It took a special breed of men at that time to man these floating lighthouses because they were very dangerous. Several of them were rammed and sunk during their long and dangerous careers and many a coast guardsman lost their lives in these disasters. The original towers were designed to be manned structures, but were later modified to be capable of remote operation from a nearby shore station. These towers are generally of a square shape, have distinctive colors, and contain lights, sound signals, and electronic aids. Let's go back and take an in-depth look at some of these aids beginning with the one most boaters have the most trouble with, buoys. Buoys, as we've said, are aids that are anchored in specific locations to serve a specific purpose. Buoys range greatly in size, shape, colors, and visual sound systems. Some buoys are lighted for nighttime use as well as for periods of low visibility, while others aren't. This system of buoys is designed to provide the captain with the proper information concerning the location and well-being of his vessel. The ranges that you see behind me, these are fixed structures that are used in pairs. Now this is for aligning one's vessel in the position in a channel. Now they may or may not be lighted, but by aligning one structure with another, a captain can position himself in the center line of the channel. You'll also find that these ranges are also used for maintaining the proper position when making a turn in the channel. These ranges are not part of the lateral system of buoys, and they don't exist in all harbor entrances, but in this case they do. While most individuals believe the ranges can only be utilized when inbound, the truth is they're just as effective going inbound or outbound. Simply look over your shoulder, because of their importance in certain channels, some ranges are lighted to allow continued usage during periods of darkness. Range lights may be red, white, or green, just as long as they're readily distinguishable from shore background lighting. However, front and rear will generally be of the same color, but will have different phase characteristics. Since both lights must be seen for the range to operate properly, the range lights will usually have a longer on interval than other lights, and rear range lights will have a longer on interval than their front counterparts. Newer ranges are usually equipped with an equal interval rear light and a quick flashing front light. Some range lights are equipped with special lenses that increase the light intensity when the proper position is held in the channel. As the vessel moves away from the center line, the line intensity decreases proportionately. This light diminishing occurs in the first few degrees off the center line. Audible fog signals are designed to assist boaters during periods of visibility when it's very poor. Sometimes they're on the end of a jetty or they're usually attached to a buoy or a light or maybe a larger aid. Audible fog signals are designed to assist boaters during periods of low visibility. They're sometimes established as individual aids, as on the end of a jetty, but are usually attached to a buoy, light, or larger aid. To be used effectively as aids to navigation, fog signals must be able to be identified and its position known. As previously mentioned, Fog signals on buoys and minor lights are operated by wave action and may be difficult to identify. However, fog signals attached to lighthouses, 
light towers, and other structures are electronically or mechanically operated and have definite time schedules, making them easier to identify. Fog signals are identified by periods of blast and silent intervals of definite lengths. These identifying timed sequences are listed in the light lists and on navigational charts. Fog signals may also be identified by the distinctive sounds they generate. Diaphones, diaphragm horns, sirens, and in some cases whistles and bells are used to make distinctive sounds, especially when fog signals are in close proximity to one another. Great care must be taken when operating in times of reduced visibility. Since fog signals rely on an atmospheric conditions to produce their identifying sound, several factors must be taken into consideration. The distance at which a fog signal can be heard will vary at any given instant with the bearing of the signal and may be different on different occasions. Under certain atmospheric conditions, you may only hear a part of the fog signal, either the high or low tones. There may be areas where you won't hear the fog signal at all, such as when it's screened by a landmass or on a high cliff. The apparent loudness of a particular signal may be louder at a distance than when in its immediate vicinity. The fog may not be readily apparent in the area of the signal. This sometimes occurs when conditions are favorable for sea fog, warm water currents, and cold air. The fog signal may be hidden by onboard noise. This can be remedied by moving about on your vessel or securing your engines at periodic intervals. Fog signals are good aids when used as warning. However, atmospheric conditions can wreak havoc on sound. The visibility of any light depends on two factors, intensity and the height above sea level. Now, these two factors, height above sea level is usually the limiting factor because of the curvature of the Earth. Primary seacoast and secondary lights are designated as such due to their greater importance as aids to navigation. They differ from the minor lights because of their physical size and light intensity characteristics. These are the most powerful lights used in the entire system of aids to navigation. The primary purpose of these lights is to warn the high seas navigator of the proximity of land. With the exception of a monster buoy or light tower, these are the first aids a navigator sees when approaching land and their use allows them to maintain a safe distance offshore when traveling at night. While almost all primary and some secondary seacoast lights are referred to as lighthouses, they may be one of several types of structures. Lighthouses vary greatly in their outward appearance depending upon where they are. The light importance, the ground they stand on, and the prevalence of violent storms. Each of these structures is painted in a conspicuous manner in order to allow easy identification and distinction from the surrounding landscape. All primary and secondary seacoast lights are identified by one or more light phase characteristics. These characteristics are arrived at by varying the intervals of light and darkness. Flashing has already been identified as a light that is on less than it is off, in a sequence of single flashes occurring less than 30 times per minute. Major lights will sometimes be identified as flashing, although their characteristics will have no relation to the flashes of buoys and minor lights. Generally, a flashing primary or secondary light will have a longer period, the time of one complete cycle and may have a longer flash. As an example, 
The Cape Hatteras light flashes once every 15 seconds with a 3 second flash. There are six basic light characteristics. Group flashing consists of two or more flashes separated by brief intervals followed by longer intervals of darkness. Alternate flashing lights have flashes of alternating colors, usually red and white, or white and green. Occulting occurs when the light is on more than it is off. Equal interval lights have periods of light and darkness that are equal. Group occulting have intervals of light regularly broken by a series of two or more eclipses, known as dark periods. Fixed and flashing is a fixed light varied at regular intervals by a flash of greater intensity. The flash may be of the same color as the fixed light, usually white or of another color. This characteristic may also be listed as fixed and group flashing. To make it even more complex, the light characteristics may be combined. Several lights have what is known as sectors. These sectors are portions of the all-around arc of light in which the normally white light appears as red. These sectors are used to indicate shoals or other hazards, including nearby land. A sector changes the color of a light when viewed from certain directions, but not the light characteristics. Sectors may be a few degrees wide, as when marking a rock or shoal, or wide enough to extend from the direction of deep water to the shore. Bearings referring to sectors are expressed in degrees as observed from a vessel toward the light. Areas of red sectors should be avoided in most instances, but a check of the local navigational chart should indicate the extent of the dangers in that particular sector. The effect of fog, rain, and snow, etc. upon visibility is obvious. Colored lights are quickly lost, and extreme care should be exercised when navigation around sectors in poor weather. Remember, the lines of distinction between red and white sectors are not as cut and dried as they appear on the chart. The lights gradually shade from one color to the next. Background lighting continues to make it more difficult to identify all navigational lights in the metropolitan areas. Extreme caution should be used when approaching these areas. In addition, power outages and failures do happen from time to time and the particular light you're looking for just might be extinguished. Unattended lights that are broken may go undetected for a period of time before being repaired. If a particular light does not appear where your data tells you it should, check for further problems. The key is not to rely on any one light. Always utilize a combination of aids as a system to check your position, checking one against the other. You know, every day millions of Americans travel throughout this country using a system of highways that are dotted with regulatory and informational signs. They provide general information such as location, distances, hazards, and speed limits. On the waterways of America, we have a similar information and control system. Except the data is provided by a system of man-made markers and are commonly grouped under the heading of AIDS to navigation. The term AIDS to navigation normally encompasses all facets of the systems of buoys, day beacons, lights, light platforms, radio beacons, foghorns, LORAN, and other electronic systems of navigation. For the purpose of this video, we'll concentrate only on the non-electronic aids. 
The United States uses a lateral system of voyage for marking its navigable waterways. What this basically means is that wherever you travel within the country, the system is the same. Changes are being made in order to conform with the standard of voyage as used by the International Association of Lighthouse Authorities. In the original system, aids to navigation were numbered starting at the seaward end of a channel or inlet. Coming in from the sea, all aids to starboard, the right side, will be red and have even numbers. Lights on these aids would either be red or white. Aids to port, the left side, would be black, have odd numbers and either green or white lights. Under the new system, the aids to starboard will remain red with even numbers and have red lights if lighted. The port side buoys will be replaced with green buoys, have odd numbers, and the lights will be green. This means that the color of lights will be consistent with the color of the buoys. Red lights on red buoys and green lights on green buoys. These changes, as well as a few others, will be discussed again later. The phrase, red, right, and returning is one method of keeping the voyage system straight in your head. This means to keep the red buoys on the right when you return from the sea. All aids to navigation appear on the appropriate navigational charts for the area being traveled. Good navigational skills begin with the ability to compare what's being seen with what's on the chart.